Welcome to the wicket. Hello and welcome again to The Wicket, where we chat all things cricket. With me as ever are John Pike, Arab News columnist, and Subhash Hamagain, Arab News cricket reporter. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning. All good? Good morning, Brian. All well. We've got plenty to talk about as ever. Uh, We talk test cricket. Uh, First, looking back at the thrilling second test between Bangladesh and New Zealand, and then looking ahead to the start of the Australia-Pakistan series, which gets underway in Perth. We talk women's cricket, with England winning the T20I series against India, while Pakistan and New Zealand and also South Africa and Bangladesh continue their white ball action. We reflect on the Women's Premier League auction, who were the winners and losers. We look back on the West Indies One Day International Series win against England and touch upon the England touring side announced to India and one or two shocks there. We chat about the start of India's tour to South Africa, touch upon Ireland's T20I series win in Zimbabwe, and also the Asian Cricket Council's Under-19 Asia Cup in Dubai, which has thrown up some great stories. So, as ever, lots to discuss. So here goes. Starting with Test Cricket, the second match of the two-test series between Bangladesh and New Zealand produced a low-scoring thriller. New Zealand won by four wickets, chasing just 137 for victory in the fourth innings, getting home thanks to Glenn Phillips and Mitchell Santner, who added an unbroken 70 after the visitors had been reduced to 69 for six. Phillips was the star of the show on a pitch that gave plenty of assistance to the spinners throughout, as uh, he also rescued New Zealand's first innings with a counter-attacking 87, and uh, there were eight wickets for Ejaz Patel. John, it was an exciting match, but was the surface fit for what is held up to be the highest form of the game? I asked, as the whole match only lasted 178 overs, and Tim Southey, the New Zealand captain afterwards, labelled it as the worst pitch he'd come across. In fact, the ICC also labelled it as unsatisfactory in their uh, post-match report. If you value the future of Test cricket, then clearly a pitch like that is, is not good enough. Tim Southey was unusually outspoken. And following on from what you said, I think the ICC have actually um, awarded a demerit point, if if you can award a demerit point. I think naturally first thoughts turn to the curator. I believe he's a, an experienced Sri Lankan. He's been there since 2010. And I think he had his contract extended in June of this year for another two years. And I think the matter runs a bit deeper. Bangladeshi captain Shanto was uh, quoted as saying that when we play tests, we are not here to improve. This is not a place for practice. We are trying to win the test. So one suspects that the curator is actually in the direction to prepare helpful pitches for, for Bangladesh, that is. And Shanto's only regret seems to be that Bangladesh did not bat well enough in the first innings. Nevertheless, I think you have to give you know, huge credit to, to Phillips and, uh, and Santner for for pulling off that um, victory partnership. Yeah, it was an exceptional stand from those two in the face of, well, almost certain defeat, it appeared, when they came together. Subash, the other major talking point of the test was Mushfika Rahim's dismissal out obstructed the field. He played a ball down from Kyle Jamieson next to his stumps and then flicked out his hand at that ball. New Zealand appealed and Mushfika was uh, given out. Now, prior to 2017... That would have been a handled ball dismissal. But in that year, it was brought under obstructed the field in the laws of cricket. What did you make of the whole thing? I think there was no debate uh, whatsoever from both the teams. Uh, Raheem, he knew that the ball was going towards the stump, but uh, the action was reflex. But uh, he, he never had a second doubt that he would be given out. I think uh, it was reflex, but was against the law. Good thing that there was no talk about the spirit of the game in here and there that has been uh, in such dismissal. But... Uh, I think Raheem was rightfully out in that in that case. So the series was shared, and uh, I suspect Bangladesh will look on that as a, a missed opportunity for a first series win against the Black Caps.
Australia against Pakistan now, and as we record this podcast on Wednesday, December the 13th, it's the eve of the first test of the three-match series between those two sides in Perth. So let's preview the action. Pakistan's new test captain, Shan Massoud, made an unbeaten double hundred in his side's warm-up match against the Prime Minister's eleven in Canberra. But spinner Abra Ahmed has been ruled out of that opening test with a leg injury. Meanwhile, team director Mohammed Hafiz has been very critical of the arrangements that his side had for the warm-up match, saying the pitch was too slow and not satisfactory ahead of the Perth encounter. Sebash, how ready do you think Pakistan are for what's to follow? I think uh, Hafiz was right to criticise the preparations. I think they, they, they should have expected a fast pitch that they were going to use on the Test match, but I think Australia are playing it right. They're too strong for Pakistan at the moment. Looking at the players and the pitch that's going to be played, uh, Pakistan are a bit under strain to follow the bowling uh, strength they had uh, with Harish Rao uh, missing out. I think he had played a lot of cricket in Australia and uh, he would have been a good addition to the team, but uh, he's not around. So Pakistan are underdogs, and I think it would be very hard for them to get any results because Australia are flying high. The fans, they are turn up in good numbers as well. So I think Pakistan have a big, big assignment ahead of them. Well, Hafiz obviously hasn't been uh, following history in that uh, criticism of facilities because uh, Australia have been sending teams to uh, the likes of Hobart and, and Canberra prior to a test match in Brisbane or Perth for as long as I can remember. But uh, John, what about Australia? Nathan Lyon is back after the calf injury that cut short his Ashes series. They look settled and surely are hot favourites. Pakistan, you know, haven't won a test in Australia this century. The odds are very firmly in favour of Australia. The curators talking up a hard, fast, bouncy pitch, something that we know the, the wacker was renowned for, and one would not be surprised to see that uh, that come about. So perhaps... Um, and Pakistan's concerns about preparation are well-founded. Well, we'll look back on that uh, Perth Test match for you in our next podcast. Women's cricket now, and there's lots to chat about in the women's game, starting with the Women's Premier League auction, which took place in Mumbai on December the 9th. The five franchises fleshed out the vacant spots in their rosters ahead of Season 2 of the tournament, Sebash, what were the main headlines for you from the auction? You predicted in our last podcast that Annabelle Sutherland would be a focus of attention, and you were spot on, as she was one of the big winners with uh, a price of two hundred and forty thousand US dollars. Yeah, I think she was rightly deserving that amount, and not just the amount. I think there were a lot of teams very excited to get her, and there was competition in amongst the team to get her. But uh, once the the price went up, I think there were only two teams going for her, and I was surprised Kim Gott and Dotin both went on show because I think uh, teams they, that wanted fast bowler spend uh, the money on local talent so that they can retain and they can have a long term investment on those players. I think Sutherland uh, she's been in top form, but uh, Samari Atapattu going on show once again. I think that that should be a big big surprise. Yes, Jamari Atapattu, who of course was the player of the tournament in the Women's Big Bash League in Australia, going unsold. Yes, a big surprise there. But John, after what you said in the previous podcast about wanting associate players to get a chance, you must have been delighted to see Catherine Bryce of Scotland being picked up by the Gujarat Giants. Yes, she becomes only the second associate picked up in a WPL after Tara Norris last year. She's um, 26 years old. She made her first appeared for Scotland 2018, so she's been playing for quite a while. She's the fifth fastest to a thousand runs in women's ODIs in pretty good company there with Meg Lanning. She's experienced. She's played in the, in the hundred in um, in England. And of course, as you just mentioned, there have been some big names left on the sidelines. Deandra Dottin, Tammy Beaumont, Amy Jones, uh, Alana King, for example. Um, so uh, it's um, it's good good news for her, and I think uh, encouraging for associate players going forward. BCCI Secretary Jay Shah says the tournament is likely to happen in February and will take place in one state, although which state that is remains to be seen. In New Zealand, Pakistan have crashed down to earth with a bump. 
After winning the T20I series against the hosts, they started the One Day International series by conceding 365 for four to lose by 131 runs. Susie Bates, who we spoke of in the previous podcast, made a superb 108 at the top of the order. And it's two very important points for New Zealand in the quest for a top six finish in the ICC Women's Championship. Remember, only those six sides uh, at the head of affairs there qualify automatically for the next Women's World Cup in India, while those sides below the line have to play in a qualifier. And uh, the news for Pakistan, uh, aside from that defeat, doesn't get any better. Diana Baig suffered a fractured finger and Nida Dar was hit in the face during the match and both their roles in the rest of the tour and now up in the air. Sebash, that's a crushing win for New Zealand and a wake-up call for Pakistan as they change formats. Yeah, absolutely. New Zealand, they knew what the main motive of this series was. The Pakistan touring uh, New Zealand was to turn to a series, was just a series and the all-important ODI series and New Zealand have started up well. And to add up to the war, I think Pakistan will, uh, will not have services of their two important players. Uh, it's going back for back from wars to Pakistan and I think the World Cup stake is all but gone and they'll be looking forward to the qualifiers and would want to make use of this last two games but uh, I think it's going to be only tougher. In South Africa, the hosts struck back against Bangladesh winning the third T20I by eight wickets in Kimberley to share that series after match two was washed out. Laura Volvart was back in the side and made an unbeaten 49. And that's more like the form, John, that we expect from the T20I uh, World Cup runners-up, isn't it? It certainly is, and um, by eight wickets in the 15th over. It's worth noting that the player of the match was a uh, 19-year-old debutant, Anada uh, Luby, and not the captain. Luby struck twice in two balls in her first over of international cricket, which is a pretty uh, impressive and dramatic start. And it's also worth noting that the player of the series was as Bangladeshi Shauna Akta. She scored 23 runs in that match, but got the award on the basis of 5 for 28 in the first match, which Bangladesh won. Yes, uh, promising signs there from Bangladesh, even though they lost that last match. Certainly women's cricket there seems to be very much on the up. England won the T20I series against India in Mumbai by two matches to one, winning the first two games impressively before a rather limp batting display in the final match gave India a consolation success. John, what were your takeaways from that uh, England-India women's series? Great to see Sophie Eccleston back, wasn't it, uh, after her shoulder injury last summer? And she was a crucial player in England's success with seven wickets. Yes, it's always good to see Sophie bowling. Um, I think there are also top performances from the spinners, Charlie Dean and Sarah Glenn, who averaged less than 12 with the ball. England did rest players for the third match and, and I think India got better across the series. Some of England's players have been playing in the... Big Bash in Australia, India's um, of course haven't. And it does take time to adjust to different formats. And it will be interesting to see how both teams cope with the switch to red ball cricket after a very, very short break. And it's incredibly nine years since India last hosted a women's test match. And they've only played two more since. And they were in the 2021-22 season. Yes, we've got that test match to look forward to. That's uh, the next action for these two sides. We'll chat about that next time here at the wicket. But, Sabash, in the meantime, what did you make of India's performances in the T20I series? I, I think uh, they should have won the series if the if the bat, batter has gone up for the second match. I think uh, they were totally outplayed by the bowling, uh, especially top order. Uh, the opening stand didn't stand in all three matches. Uh, Safali Burma fired in the first game, but I think after that, uh, she faltered in the booth and Smriti kept the innings. But I think uh, batting was batting side. I think India should have kept a better performance from the batters. The bowling, it was average. At the second game, I think they tried to make a game out of defending 81, but it was too low for a total to be defended. Let's talk now about West Indies and England, the men's uh, teams. West Indies won their three-match ODI series against England, securing that success with a four-wicket victory in a rain-affected game in Barbados after England had levelled the series in Game 2 in Antigua with a comfortable six-wicket win that included a return to form with the ball for Sam Curran. On top of that, on Tuesday night, December the 12th, just before recording this podcast, 
The West Indies won the first T20I of a pre-Christmas series by four wickets after England could muster only 51 from the final nine overs of the innings before a recalled Andre Russell blasted the hosts to victory with the bat. John, that's a dispiriting uh, one-day international series loss for England, isn't it? Lots of fresh faces, uh, but uh, the team really do need a pick-me-up, don't they, after a disastrous uh, World Cup? So uh, this was hardly what the doctor ordered. I think it's uh, disappointing rather than dispiriting for me. As you mentioned, the new-look team, uh, younger players, they were in a position uh, to win the two games that they lost. I think the most disappointing me was slumping to 49 for five in the third match. In the first, they were done by the brilliance of Shea Hope and uh, Mara Shepard. I think there's a real concern uh, around Butler, although he did get some runs in the T20. And I think Brooke as well isn't really firing and, and uh, I wish he'd stop getting run out. But on the other hand, uh, you know, looking at looking at it um, in the round, it's great for West Indies cricket. Yes, talking about the West Indies, uh, Sebash, it was a great result for the West Indies, as was their success in the first T20 international. But I guess you could argue it was overshadowed by the news that Jason Holder, Nicholas Puran and Kyle Mayers have all turned down central contracts. What do you make of that? I think this is a story repeating all over. West Indies, uh, we saw big names like Polar Bravo pulling out the names in previous years. I think that there have been other instances in other boards as well. And with franchise cricket coming up, I think we'll see more of these. But uh, surprising is that uh, this is a World Cup year and they're playing World Cup in home conditions. So I think one can expect these players to turn up in the World Cup, but uh, turning down central contract, I think there's a huge issue coming up uh, with franchise cricket versus international cricket. Let's chat now about the England touring party for the Test Series in India. The England selectors have decided to put all their eggs in a very inexperienced spin basket. They've picked Shoaib Bashir, a 20-year-old off-spinner from Somerset, who's got just 10 first-class wickets, in addition to left-arm spinner Tom Hartley and Rehan Ahmed, the young leg spinner who went to Pakistan uh, last winter. That's on top of Jack Leach, who himself is only coming back after a stress fracture of the back that saw him sidelined for the whole Ashes campaign last summer. So uh, there's a lot of uh, question marks against that spin attack. And John, on surfaces that we expect to uh, really help the spinners to an appreciable degree, this really is, uh, well, a remarkable set of players that have been named. Yes, uh, very much so. It seems like the selectors have given up on previous young spinners who've been uh, tested. Uh, and of course, there are experienced ones, such as Liam Dawson, and then there's Will Jacks, plus Liam Livingston, who you know, aren't in the squad because they are going to be playing franchise cricket. It's a big gamble, but it is one strategy to use in the increasingly difficult landscape of of having test cricket coexist with the shorter formats. I mean, good luck to them. And I think also it's worth noting that uh, in relation to India and perhaps spin-friendly wickets, that um, Ben Folkes is back in the squad. Now, those who delight in having the best wicket keeper will be very pleased with that, that decision. On top of those young spinners that have been picked, I think it's also worth noting that Rian Ahmed's brother, Farhan, I think he's 15, is in the England under-19 squad. There's promise in the cupboard, and I guess they'll sink or swim. Of course, the other uh, elephant in the room for England going into the India Tour is how fit Ben Stokes is going to be after his knee surgery that uh, followed the ICC Cricket World Cup. But, Sebash, I just wonder, from your perspective... Do you think Basball can continue to work in Indian conditions? We've seen it work uh, around the world in every other uh, set of conditions, but can England's uh, freewheeling form of Test match cricket uh, still survive in the furnace of India? I don't. I don't see why they they don't uh, opt to go with this. I think they, that's been working wonders for them. They've got the results. They've got the approach that's been working. And India is going to be a bit different with this spin track. But I think uh, Indian condition is going to be a bit tougher. And with the uh, fans turning up, it will be different. But I think Makulam has played in India. He enjoys playing in India. And uh, the approach of, of batting, I think that has worked everywhere. And India is going to be no different. Even though the result may not be on their side, but the approach, I think they should stick with it. 
Now let's look at India against South Africa, the India tour to uh, Southern Africa. And the first international of that tour in Durban, a T20 international was washed out. But uh, in game two, South Africa won a Duckworth Lewis Stern adjusted uh, target after more rain. Subash, in that second game, both India openers were out for ducks, but Surya Kumar Yadav and Rinku Singh, who I know you're a big fan of, impressed for the touring side, both got half centuries. What did you make of that match? I think India are getting their answers for this uh, middle overs uh, for the World Cup squad getting ready. Uh, Surya Kumar Yadav are good uh, half century under pressure and Rinku Singh has showed that he's not only there for to finish but to build the innings as well. He's been doing it in the domestic cricket and it, having both openers sent out that early is not good but I think India would be impressed with that performance. Would have been icing on the cake if they have won it but uh, I think it was just easy target for South Africa to chase once the game came in but uh, Good thing, Rain Kusing, once again, proving himself out in the middle and this time in different scenarios. Yes, John, it's encouraging to see South Africa win, albeit with that reduced target. And uh, Gerald Kutsia, the fast bowler, again impressed, as he did in the World Cup, picking up three wickets. He really does look a fantastic find for South Africa, doesn't he? Yes, he's um, he's got a, an edge to him as well. I think it's a shame that the opener was washed out because it was sold out and um, that would have been a good money spinner for Cricket South Africa. And both teams have got limited number of matches now, I think four each, to sort out the combinations for the 2024 World Cup. And South Africa have got potential debutants to, to come in as they... They reshape their side. They've got to decide, I think, who's going to keep wicket uh, now that uh, de Kock has, has retired. But um, promising signs for them. Let's chat now about uh, Zimbabwe and Ireland. And the news for the Zimbabwe men's team continues to be bad. This year, they failed to qualify for the 50-over ICC Cricket World Cup. And then more recently, of course, They lost out in their bid to reach next year's ICC T20 World Cup. Very surprising that as well. Now they've lost a T20i series at home to Ireland, going down 2-1 in Harare. John, it's a great result for the Irish in Paul Sterling's first series as a full-time white ball captain. Harry Tector was outstanding in the decider, along with George Dockrell in a run chase that gave Ireland a six-wicket win. What were your impressions of the series? Well, I think it's terrific for the Irish, having lost the first match by one wicket off the last ball. And they certainly regrouped. Had a comfortable win in the second match and at 37 for four in the third, chasing 140. It was, as you say, an impressive effort by Tector and Dockrell. And uh, don't forget that Tector also starred in the run chase in the second match when they chased down, what, 166 uh, with only two balls to spare. So real uh, nail-biting efforts and, and Ireland showing an ability to win in tight situations. Encouraging signs for Ireland, but another disaster for Zimbabwe, Sebastian, to add to that catalogue of woe this calendar year. And worst of all was surely new captain Sikanda Raza's suspension. He missed games two and three of the series, the matches that Zimbabwe lost, after being suspended for an accumulation of disciplinary points over the past two years, having been involved in an ugly confrontation with Josh Little and Curtis Camphor. Was that just an illustration of the pressure and frustration he and the side are feeling after a run of poor results? Yeah, I think uh, Sikadar Raza is a lucky cricketer. Uh, he missed out on the last World Cup and the team, uh, his post-match con- press conference, I think uh, he was saying how big it means for Zimbabwe cricket. And this time around, they had a golden opportunity. I think they had the best opportunity to play the World Cup and they missed out. I think that has hit them hard. And even though they missed out the World Cup, I think that uh, the turnout was large in the Harari cricket ground. First time they played day-night matches in there. And the fans deserved a good result. And they didn't turn out in this one as well. I think Zimbabwe, they should reinvigorate themselves. Losing to Ireland in home is never a good result after missing out on a World Cup and Sikhar Darwaza's suspense. And I think he's going through a rough phase, but he's an excellent cricketer. He's been retained in IPL franchise. So that, that, that means a lot for an individual. And I think he should get back to firing to Zimbabwe if he, if he wants to prove himself in national colours as well. As we record this podcast on Wednesday, December the 13th, a one-day international series between the two sides is starting, and we'll update you on that next time.
Let's have a chat now about the Asian Cricket Council Under-19 Asia Cup that's uh, taking place in Dubai. The tournament got underway on December the 8th. It involves eight teams, six of which are off to South Africa for next year's ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup. That's India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Afghanistan and Pakistan. The other two sides on show the hosts, UAE and Japan. Subash, what have you made of things so far? I know you've been following it quite closely. There's been a crushing win for Pakistan over India, a great success, that, by eight wickets. And the UAE beat Sri Lanka. What have your headlines been? I think Pakistan should be the headlines. Uh, that win against India, that was an active batting performance. And Pakistan's investment in junior cricket recently has been the difference. I think they had a Pakistan junior league just for the under 19s, and they had junior players from around the world play in that series, and that surely made their talent ready for this. And they've come in, they've, they've won with ease against Nepal, against India, they just continued. And UAE, I think their home conditions, they used that for their advantage, so beating Sri Lanka in under-19s. I think that, that was a huge result for the under-19s team that missed out on the World Cup. So overall, I think it, it has not been a good story for Nepal, but uh, Pakistan and uh, UAE win, I think that, that that's really the headline. John, there's been a huge level of interest in the tournament with tens of thousands of people tuning into the Asian Cricket Council streams. Is the message that we need more of these events to help the teams transition to senior cricket? I'd be interested in seeing a geographical breakdown of those viewing figures, see how much is skewed towards you know, the India-Pakistan match. As Sebastian says, Pakistan looked to have a good young talent pool. Um, but I think the answer to your question is yes, especially for those countries and teams with less facilities and fewer opportunities to play. It's interesting you mentioned the viewing figures there, John. Uh, at one stage, I know uh, the number of people watching the Nepal-Afghanistan stream was in excess of the, the India-Pakistan stream, if you can believe that. So that, that just goes to show the level of interest in those two emerging countries. And Sebastian, just put your Nepal hat on for a moment. What have you made of their performances? Uh, they had suffered a crushing loss at the hands of uh, India but of course, they've got the ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup coming up soon. What is their progress like towards that event? The performance has been optimal. I think uh, we expected some fights from the batsmen, but uh, it has gone from back to worse. The conditions, I think that has got a big role to play. Uh, now that the World Cup has been shifted to South Africa, the pitches that have been used in this tournament has been a face ball of friendly. So we, we've struggled against face in our long history. So uh, the under 19 is no different. Uh, I think there's a lot of learning to take away, uh, especially the, that game against Pakistan, playing against quality fast bowlers. Uh, we didn't uh, play well at the top, but middle order made sure we play good spin. But once again, against India, we struggled with the pace bowlers. And I think that's what we're going to face in South Africa as well. So I think we should make use of this uh, poor performance, see what's wrong, uh, maybe make a few changes in this squad. I think we made three changes in this squad after two years because the, the team had been gelled in and you know, but none of these new new players uh, performed. So I think uh, it's going to be back to the drawing room for the coach and look what's wrong, what went wrong and be ready for the World Cup. Yes, the ICC have released the schedule for that Under-19 Cricket World Cup next year in January and February in South Africa. It'll take place in five venues, East London, Bloemfontein, Kimberley, Potchefstroom and Benoni, with the final at the latter venue on Sunday the 11th of February. Another news line is that the Abu Dhabi T10 has wrapped up for another edition and it's been won by the New York Strikers, last year's runners-up who beat the Deccan Gladiators in the final. The strikers included Kyron Pollard and Sonny on the Rhine, whose two overs uh, produced two for six in that final. Remarkable figures in a T10 game, and that was fairly decisive. While uh, Deccan featured Andre Russell, who we've mentioned already on this podcast, who's been recalled to the West Indies T20 squad for the series against England, perhaps with a view to next year's T20 World Cup. John, it's not a format for the purists. 
but it's a tournament that's endured, and now uh, Sri Lanka is set to adopt the same format. What do you make of it? You can probably guess what I think about it, <clears throat> but there is more of it play than, than one realises. And the Abu Dhabi tournament tends to get the headlines, but as you say, it's due to start in Sri Lanka, and I think also in Kenyan, possibly Fiji and Malaysia. There's already the Zim Afro tournament, there's the US Masters, and of course there's the European Cricket League. I mean, whatever next, five overs? The biggest issue for me, out of a number of issues about it, is the number of players who may or do not get a game, and the, particularly also the advantage that's provided to the team batting second. And I think the stats show that 70% of teams batting second actually turn out to be the winners. And Sebash, do you think it's a format that helps grow the game in non-traditional markets? Cricket-wise, I think no, but uh, entertainment-wise, I think uh, it, it would be a good medium to get to these markets. But uh, if you see skill-wise, I think there's a, there's very little space for the bowlers in these games, and it's it's about hitting, hitting, and only hitting. So to get into the uh, new teams, I think entertainment-wise, it would be good for the spectators, but for cricket, I think it's a big no. It would be remiss of us not to mention the passing of uh, Joe Solomon, the former West Indies batter who's died aged 93. Joe played 27 tests in the 1950s and 1960s, but perhaps he's best known for his dead-eyed throw from side-on to run out Ian Meckith in Brisbane in 1960, a piece of fielding that resulted in the first tied test. I was fortunate to meet Joe in 2000 at a 40-year reunion of the two teams for that match, and he was a lovely individual. Some sad news then, but of course, he created an iconic moment in the history of the game, and for that, we should all be eternally grateful. John, uh, what are your thoughts on the passing of Joe Solomon? Yes, as you say, an iconic moment. It's certainly one that uh, helped build up my interest in, in cricket as a, as a young man. And the comment that I remember most about, about the piece of feeling was Garfield Sobers, who said that had the ball gone to anybody else in the West Indian team, Mekif would have got the one run that he needed. Let's look ahead then to what the next week has in store, as we always do, gentlemen, as uh, our last call on each episode. What are your plans for the week, cricket-wise? And what are you looking forward to, Sebash, first of all? Yeah, I'll be at the domestic cricket back again in Nepal. The women's tournament is starting next week, and I'll have, be at the, at the tournament with an eye on Pakistan Australia series. And John, what are you uh, up to? Well, as usual, trying to keep warm with thoughts of uh, the Caribbean, hoping that disappointment doesn't um, uh, turn into uh, feeling um, dispirited. I think on a brighter note, looking forward to the, the test match, the women's test match between India and England to see how they're just and to see if England can show some dominance in that format. Well, plenty to look forward to, as there always is at this time of the year in the cricket world, of course. But uh, that's all for this episode of The Wicket. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back soon with more cricket chat from the Gulf region, Asia and worldwide. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment on what you've heard wherever you get your podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback and let us know if there's anything you'd like us to feature in future episodes. For now, though, this is Brian Murgatroyd along with John Pike and Subash Hamagain saying thank you very much indeed for listening. And we look forward to your company next time. 